So it's my privilege uh, to inter introduce Tim Spears, who's a professor of American Studies at the college. And by coincidence, one of our featured pilots downstairs is Waldo Heinrichs, who retired in, 19, in the late 1950s as a professor of American Studies at Newberry College. And Waldo is quite well known because as a pilot, he's known as the luckiest guy in the war because he survived uh, two uh, fatalities when he was shot down by the Germans, the last one ending up in a German uh, hospital. But he's one of uh, three uh, pilots that are featured in the exhibit. So Tim has been at the college since uh, 1990. He's also an author. Uh, he's written about football and he's written about uh, several books about the Midwest. And, uh, but as important as his job as a uh, professor is um, uh, that he's also in the administration um, at the college and uh, has held a very important position as vice president for academic development uh, for the last several years. So a real privilege, and he can tell you about how he came to this. Uh, I want to uh, introduce him other than say he came to this project, and it's very interesting how he got there and what's resulted. So Tim, welcome. Thank you very much. I really appreciate you all being here, especially given the weather. So um, you must all be a little crazy to be inside. Um, so uh, as Bill said, I came upon this project in a sort of unexpected way. And uh, it really came through a trip I took with my family to France uh, three years ago and happening upon uh, the World War I cemeteries in that area. And that kindled in me an interest in photography and uh, you know, sort of the interest in the, an interest in this visual landscape. Um, and then eventually it took me into the archive to do a little uh, historical research on the nature of these landscapes and how they came to evolve. So I'm going to try and balance those two perspectives as we go through this presentation. I've got about 50 slides. Um, I'll be uh, chatting for about, for about a half an hour and then I hope we can open things up for discussion. Um, I guess I say as people who give talks like this, like I say, this project is you know, very much in its beginning stages. And I say that if only because uh, I've discovered over my, the last couple of years of looking into this, how big this topic really is. Um, really, I think what I'm trying to get at here is the visual landscape of commemoration uh, and the landscapes that evolved in, uh, particularly in Europe after the war, uh, to mark uh, the trauma of the war. And of course, the Americans played an important role in that uh, enterprise in, in that war, but it wasn't nearly quite, the war didn't have the same impact on the United States as it did on France, England, and, uh, and Germany. So I want to just talk a little bit about uh, the sort of scope of this uh, before I start going through the slides. Um, you know, I, what I have here is a screenshot essentially of the region in uh, northeastern France. Um, it's not a terribly great map. It's a screenshot taken from the American Battle Monuments Commission. And those little uh, black uh, sort of droplets are uh, indications of where the American Battle where there are monuments and cemeteries, United States, uh, uh, that, that, that were erected by the United States after the war. Now, of course, the, the American involvement in the war started in 1917 and it ended in November of 1918. Um, and the casualty rate was, was horrific. Um, and I just want to talk a little bit about the American casualty, casualty rate here in reference to what I'll be uh, looking at in just a second. So um, 100, roughly 117,000 Americans died in World War I, uh, and 30,000 of them are buried uh, in France England and Belgium, the majority of them being in, in France. Um, and an interesting sort of side issue here is that uh, the Americans, uh, the United States was the only country that allowed for the repatriation of bodies. So in other words, there was a big debate over what should happen to the fallen dead after World War I, uh, and there was a desire within the military to bury men where they fell. Um, but through uh, a series of political conversations, eventually, uh, there, the decision was made to bring bodies back to the United States for the families who wanted to bring those bodies back. And that continues to be the policy in the United <coughs> States, uh, the military policy today. Um, that wasn't necessarily the case, by the way, for the British, um, all of whose the, the, the casualties there. Uh, and by the way, the British lost uh, 750,000 uh, men in, in World War I, were buried uh, mostly on site. Now, to, 
put this in proportion, um, I mean, the, 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 the obvious point comes clear at the, at the outset, which is to say the Americans lost far, far fewer uh, casualties in the war than, uh, than Britain and France did. Um, but nonetheless, the Americans went forward with creating these commemorative landscapes, which I'm going to be looking at today. The American uh, death rate in, in the Civil War was 620,000. Okay, so that's a really big number, and it overwhelms the number of casualties that were lost in World War I. And I mentioned uh, the Civil War because uh, that, that, that's important context for some of the things that I'm going to be talking about today. Okay, so these World War I cemeteries that we're talking about, um, there were eight in all. There were six in France, one in Belgium, and one in England. And the largest of these cemeteries is uh, the Meuse Argonne American Cemetery. And in fact, that's the cemetery, the first cemetery I saw when we went over to France a couple years ago. And there are 14,000 men buried in that cemetery. It opened in 1918, uh, and it was dedicated in 1937. So the point I want to make here when we start to look at the slides is that there are, there are two separate things going on here. One has to do with the burial of bodies, which in and of itself was a major enterprise and books have been written on that. And then there was the commemoration of the sites in which the bodies were finally, the, the places where the bodies were finally buried. So there was kind of a, an ad hoc, ready-made uh, process for burying bodies. And then the American Battle Monuments Commission, um, which was established in 1923, came in and built out the sites that these bodies uh, were interred in. And so there was uh, a certain amount of aggregation of, of, uh, of remains and so on and so forth in order to create these sites. Now, the focus of the talk really in terms of sort of the administrative history here is uh, the American Battle Monuments Commission, often sort of called uh, by the acronym the ABMC. Um, the American Battle Monuments Commission was created just after World War I uh, and through legislation passed uh, within Congress, and uh, it still exists. And its primary mission was to create, was to memorialize the dead uh, to create these commemorative sites, monuments and cemeteries um, in, in, in France and in England. And in this also but very important uh, aspect of its work, the ABMC was asked to uh, mark the battlefields. And I'm going to be talking a little bit more about what that means, but uh, essentially it meant that the uh, American Battle Monuments Commission um, was charged with going out and basically rendering a history of the war from the uh, American Expeditionary Forces point of view. In other words, what kind of progress did the American uh, forces make on the ground and how can we best document that? And what that resulted in was a series of divisional histories, written histories, and also uh, something like 19 terrain photographs, albums of terrain photographs, literally pictures they went out and took of the battlefield. So, the, the Army was very interested in documenting its work, and Congress recognized this in, the, in its legislation. And I also want to underscore that point because in, a lot, in much of the scholarship that's been written about the American Battle Monuments Commission, that aspect of their work has not been uh, emphasized uh, as much as the, the memorials, and for understandable reasons. So the American Battle Monuments Commission uh, started out within the War Department. Uh, and very soon uh, migrated to a status so that it was part of the executive branch. And it still exists. And some of you may be familiar with the American Battle Monuments Commission. You can go to their website. Uh, they, have a very, they, do a, they have a very vital public history program. And they now oversee something like 27 or 28 uh, sites abroad. So basically, because of World War I, or in the aftermath of World War I, the United States created the ABMC. And they then became responsible for helping to build uh, and manage uh, cemeteries and monuments abroad, and so that is continued, obviously. So the ABMC is the agency that oversees uh, all of the cemeteries uh, that you see connected to World War II uh, in, in Europe. Um, the thing that's important that we should keep in mind as we move through these slides is that uh, World War I really established the, uh, the opportunity for the United States to create an international presence uh, abroad and to create a, a vernacular, an aesthetic that uh, essentially became the way in which uh, the United States chose to honor soldiers who fought on international soil. Um, so the look and feel of the buildings and the landscapes were created in World War I continued to be the vernacular that has guided the creation of other sites across the world. Okay, and it's a Beaux-Arts architecture. In other words, it's a kind of architecture that looks very much like the National Mall, the sort of things that you see in in Washington and in a sort of funny sleight of hand, the United States basically imported European forms of architecture and then exported them to create these 
a commemorative site. Um, so let me go forward with the pictures. And what I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through these slides fairly quickly and try and uh, identify them as best I can. Um, this is the only color slide you will see. Um, these, the, 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 the images are a sort of reflection of, an, of my interest in these sites as visual landscapes, so they're all my pictures. Um, and I've, for a variety of reasons, which we could talk about if you're interested, um, chose, have chosen to uh, produce them in black and white. So this is Sammy Hell. Uh, this is a cemetery, uh, American cemetery, located uh, down near Verdun. Um, and I mean, the thing that's, that you'll note in all of these uh, representations of, or on all these landscapes, is that they're very formal landscapes. Um, and uh, you'll also see uh, in these landscapes a real attention to what you might call sort of nationalistic detail. And I want to come back to that because one of the things I want to get at in this, in this talk is the way in which the American commemorative landscape differs from the others that you find in this area. Um, so if you drive, and I'm sure many of you have been to this area in northeast France, you drive, everywhere you drive you see signs of World War I. You see, you see monuments, you see cemeteries. You see French cemeteries, you see British cemeteries, um, and of course you find American cemeteries. And so what I'm going to try and do, particularly towards the end of this slideshow, is uh, make some uh, suggestions as to how the American uh, memorial landscapes differs from, say, for instance, the British or even the French. And my, my comparison is mostly going to be with the British. Um, and if there's any argument in this talk, and there is a little bit of one towards the end, it's that the Americans chose a different way to uh, to honor the sacrifice made by the American expeditionary forces. And they did so in a way that some might consider to be uh, slightly more sort of didactic than they say, for instance, the British did. Okay, so uh, not dim the glory that this ends up becoming uh, the sort of the logo for the American Battle Monuments Commission. And here you see this, I'm not gonna read all of these photographs, but I mean, here we have a, you know, it's a fairly martial looking eagle. Um, this is Chateau Santory. And the thing, the point I would make here is that uh, there were two features of the American Battle I'm going to call it, the ABMC's work in the years after uh, uh, World War I. One was to create cemeteries, to build out the cemeteries, to inter the dead, and the other was to establish monuments. Okay, so they're two separate things, though in some of the cemeteries you get, the sen you get a sense that their monuments included within the cemeteries, as you sort of did in that first slide. Um, the ABMC was also very careful about creating these monuments. They wanted to site the monuments in strategic locations where, it's depending on how the, the war had been fought, uh, and they had a hierarchy of, of monuments. Some monuments were considered to be more important than others. Uh, this one in Chateau Santeria is considered to be one of the more important mo monuments, and it's a fairly big structure. When I saw it a couple years ago, it was under, it's actually being under renovation. This is uh, the Chateau Santeria from the side. Um, the people who designed these, uh, uh, these, these structures were sort of very well-known uh, Beaux-Arts architects located primarily in the East Coast of the United States, people like John Pope and Paul Crett. Um, the American Battle Monuments Commission's job was to essentially do the administrative work to guide the construction of these sites. So I think I said at the outset, the American Battle Monuments Commission was a commission appointed by the president. The person who led the commission at the outset was General John Pershing, uh, who had led the uh, American Expeditionary Forces during World War I. Um, I was mentioning to Bill the other day when we were talking about this presentation that uh, Pershing had an extensive background in the military, uh, but what's also interesting is that uh, he lost his wife and children in a fire in, in the Presidio in San Francisco before the war. So uh, he had not been, you know, he'd been accustomed to trauma in his personal life but in his oversight of the American Battle Monuments Commission, uh, he was a pretty stern taskmaster. He was very concerned with projecting an image of strength uh, on the world stage. Um, so the American Battle Monuments Commission itself was in its early years headed up by a man named X.H. Price, uh, who was a major uh, in the AEF, and he had run uh, the cartography operation during the war and came from Saginaw, Michigan. And I just love that guy, X.H. Price. I brought a lot of correspondence from X.H. Price and the people who worked with him were army officers who had been detailed to the American Battle Monuments Commission. So this was basically a military-run operation, so, so to speak. And as I said, their job was to take orders from the commission. All architectural designs 
had to be approved by the Fine Arts Commission, which is the same commission, by the way, that approves the uh, various installations that you see on, 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 on the Washington Mall. So the government was very concerned that this, be that this work be done at a certain level of excellence. Uh, and the American Battle Monuments Commission was essentially, in these early years, carrying out orders uh, and working with the architects, working with builders, working with engineers. Last point about these sites before I move on to the next slide. The Americans, the United States does not own the land that these uh, monuments are site, and cemeteries are sited on. Rather, they're ceded territories, which is to say that the land has been loaned in perpetuity to the United States in grateful recognition of the sacrifices made by Americans in the war. Okay, I'm going to move on. Here's, just, here's another scene from uh, Chateau saint -Terie. Uh, this is Montfaucon. This was seen as the most important of the American monuments, uh, located further, uh, further south, uh, further south in uh, Chateau saint -Terry. Um And there's an interesting exchange that I read about in the archives that took place between Pershing and the architect who designed, who was working with a sculptor uh, who designed the, the, the female figure at the top of this plinth. And uh, originally, Pershing objected to the way in which the, uh, the, the statue had been designed because she was showing weakness. Uh, so the sculptor went back to the drawing board and came up with a more, uh, I don't know, sort of uh, strong figure. I think this is uh, Ain Marn. Uh, this is near Bella Wood. Uh, again, this emphasizes the sort of formal landscaping uh, that you see in these sites. This is Flanders Field American Cemetery, uh, located in Belgium. Um, there are only 368 uh, men buried in this site, um, but the site is given every bit as much meticulous care as all the other cemeteries. The cemeteries include, in addition to grounds uh, where men were interred, um, each one has a chapel, uh, and there's also they all have ceremonial gates, and they're very well, very, very well uh, meticulously landscaped inside uh, Flanders. This is San Miguel. Uh, this is looking outside the gate. As again, you can see the sort of ornamental gate. Uh, and it's true for most of these cemeteries that they're located in fairly rural areas. So you go to these cemeteries and you look out upon you know, gorgeous agricultural landscape, though these days I think somewhat economically depressed. The cemeteries and the monuments, as I said, were located in strategic sites, in other words, where the battles were fought. So when you go to these places, uh, you have the sense that you're sort of treading on ground that um, has, been, has been fought over and people died for. Uh, this is San Mihel, uh looking out towards the Butte de Montsec. Um, let's see if I can do this. That would be out here, back in here. So the Butte de Montsec, there's a monument there, which I will show an image of a little bit later in the show, and later in the slideshow. But the, the point I'm trying to make here, I guess, through this image is that these are also, these, are, these sites are places for reflection. Um, there are benches strewn around uh, the grounds of many of these places. Uh, the cemeteries were created so that family members could come back. Uh, the term Gold Star Mother really gained traction during World War I, and so people would come and visit, <coughs> visit these graves. Um, and the times that I've been there, what's really interesting about these places is they're not terribly well visited by Americans. Now that may be a little bit different now. Yeah, my, was this an area where there were trenches during the war? Uh, I can't say exactly about this place, but many of the sites I have been to, there are trenches around them. I mean, this is the thing about visiting this area, is that there are signs of the war, World War I, even still. Trenches, you know, you go, you wander through the woods, uh, you look at the trenches, you see signs saying, please don't, please don't wander off the path because there are armaments, uh, and you, you, know, you risk something by doing, uh, by going off track. And by the way, all of these, the other, I should have said, all of these sites also have superintendents there to look after the sites and little sort of superintendents' cottages. Uh, this is Meuse Argonne, uh, the largest of the cemeteries. And I mean, one of the things that strikes me about these sites uh, is the aesthetic is, it's, it's a rationalized kind of beauty. Um, and uh, in just a, in, a, in, a, in a few minutes, we'll talk a little bit, or I'll show you some slides of uh, domestic cemeteries, which will give you a a sense of the difference between these kinds of uh, landscapes and what existed in parallel in the United States at this time. Again, Muse Argonne, and again, very sort of beautiful, rationalized labeling of the sections. Muse Argonne, 
Are they all marble or here? This are all marble. Yeah. So they're either. Um, what's interesting too about some of these uh, about these cemeteries is that you have uh, there's a range of sort of denominational markers. There's the cross. There's also the Star of David, and I think more recently um, they may have uh, created uh, a sort of figure for Islamic faith. Does the, yeah. does the plaque give the regiment they belong to, or just their place of birth or their home? Or no, it's pretty. Uh, it's, it's fairly spare. Um, well, I take that back. I mean, you get right in here. You see the uh, you see the rank. So there's a corporal. 313th Infantry, 79th Division, Maryland, died October 1st, 1918. Mm -hmm. um, that question throws me a little bit because um, I'll show some images from the National Cemetery uh, system and the marking system is a little bit different. Um, okay, so this is some. Um, of course, we all know about some because this is the area where some very bloody battles were fought. Um, the Americans, of course, were later, later to the war and did not participate in these really big battles. But what's interesting to me about this image, about this is a chapel, by the way. Um, you get this kind of display of uh, you know, sort of weaponry up on the top, um, which I think distinguishes it from some of the installations you might see that are French or, or, uh, or British. Though I should say that there, this is kind of a... Uh, it's a motif in a lot of military cemeteries. If you go to, say, for instance, uh, domestic cemeteries that are part of the national cemetery system, if you go to, like, I don't know, uh, Shiloh or Fort Donaldson or someplace like that, you will see, you know, there'll be cannons there or, you know, shells or what have you. But this seems to be a little bit more specific. This is the interior of one of the chapels. Uh, this is uh, Ain Martin. So this is on the back side, uh, the side of Bella Woods, which was a very important battle uh, fought during World War One, in which the Marines laid claim to that ground. Um, and so you can see this sort of dramatic view of the of the countryside beyond uh, Bella Woods. <coughs> San Mihal. I mean, even I, I thought this was kind of interesting. I mean, sometimes you get this little funny little detail in some of these uh, cemeteries. And here's a little birdhouse. Um, Again, markers of the of the battles that were fought in the area, uh, the sort of divisional markers down here. I love these details. This is again at San Miguel. You know, you get this kind of identification of you know when the uh, when the chapel was built. This is very unusual. This is a San Miguel. This is uh, I guess you'd call this uh, a representation of a doughboy. Um, and there were quite a lot of statues of, the, of this type in the United States and town squares and the like. This is the only representation of a soldier that I was, have been able to find in any of these Americans, World, World War I American cemeteries. And it, you know, doing these kinds of representations was not part of the aesthetic uh, that the ABMC wanted to promote. Um, they wanted, I think, a more rationalized order. And I should, I should mention here that the superintendent, the ranger at this, uh, Cemetery uh, told us that this was put up uh, because, through a lot of political maneuvering by the mother of the, of, of the young man who died. Uh, she pushed, you know, basically she was told no, and then she went back to her senator, and she managed to get this statue built. The, the, the personage is not named, so it's a, not, it's a kind of unnamed uh, man. One of the things that was going on with the American Battle Monuments Commission or with the, the creation of memorials after the war is that a division or a battalion would go in and liberate a town and they'd immediately put up a monument celebrating uh, the, the exploit. Um, Pershing wanted to get rid of all that. You know, he wanted all monuments to go through his office so that we were going to put up, if the United States was going to put up markers uh, you know, honoring the American uh, contributions in the war, it needed to be done by, uh, it needed to be done to, by the United States government and it needed to be quality control. Um, as some of you may know, that Teddy Roosevelt's son fought in World War I, died, and was buried in a small village, and there was a memorial put up in his honor. And then 20 years later, you know, the, the memorial went into disrepair, and it took a lot of maneuvering within the ABMC to finally move the, the body to another place. We ended up in the Normandy uh, Cemetery. Um, and the guy who was running the American Battle Monuments Commission at this time, a guy named Thomas North, basically flouted all bureaucratic procedure 
and b move the body, just move the body to Normandy, despite the fact that the bureaucracy, the bureaucratic guidelines they had did not allow it. Again, a little detail from what these places now look like. They've all been modernized, they're ADA accessible. Okay, so this is, uh, to me, very interesting. So um, there are unknown markers um, in, in, in the World War I cemeteries in France. So basically what this is signifying is that there's a body here where they, don't, they haven't been able to identify uh, uh, the soldier. And I should note, as you probably already know, that you know, a huge number of um, casualties during World War I were, were, were people who didn't die in battle but died of, of disease, flu. Okay, so this is the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. Um, this is in Arlington, Virginia. <coughs> and I mean, there's this whole, there's a pretty big literature on unknowns, and a lot of the nations put up their own sort of unknown soldier monuments um, as a way of trying to exemplify the phenomenon that that little cross, you know, catches in a, in a very specific way. Um, one of the things that I was interested to discover when I went into this project is that the whole idea of marking <coughs> unknown bodies was not new in World War I. In fact, if you go back and look at uh, the national cemeteries, which is something I'm now doing, um, there are many unknown markers of soldiers who died uh, during uh, the Civil War. So this is in Baton Rouge, um, and here we have uh, unknown U.S. soldiers, presumably from, uh, from the Civil War. Okay, so I'm taking a little detour here. This is Menin Gate. Um, this was designed uh, by a man named Reginald Bromfield. It's a, it's a British monument, and uh, it's, it's huge, it's, very, it's, 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 fairly, it's fairly grand. This is basically, it spans the street, it's a bridge. Uh, and the, the, the thing that I want to pay attention to here are all the names on the wall. Okay, so um, there's a the, the historian Thomas LaCour, who's written, recently written a really great book, quite long book, about 550 pages, called The Work of the Dead. Um, he calls World War I the age of necronominalism. And what he means by that is that because of the trauma of World War I, the European countries in Britain chose to name the dead, the, the, the men who died in the war. And in previous wars in Europe, uh, men were not named. They, they, when they fell and they were buried, they, they, they didn't put names up on the grave. They didn't put names on the graves. And instead they were put in mass graves or they were buried in a kind of ad hoc way. But that all changed in World War I as a way of trying to heal the trauma of the war. And what's interesting from the American perspective is that this had already happened in the Civil War. So we, you know, the Americans lost 660,000 men during the Civil War, and you know, the ones who could, identify, who could be identified got grave markers with their names on them. So you know, it was, it, it's an interesting thing to think about, that this, this form of commemoration is something that came to the United States before it came, uh, before it came, before it came to Europe. This is inside uh, of Menin Gate. And if you go in here, as I did, I mean, I think right over here is that this isn't a very good rendition from this color. You can see that this was, in fact, a poppy. Um, that, you know, people still come back to these memorials and they leave mementos. And by the way, that happens in our own national military cemeteries as well. Okay, so this is Tiapfal. Uh, this is the uh, monument to the missing of some uh, 79,000 British soldiers uh, who died, but whose remains, who, who could never be recovered and identified. And, um, of all the work that I've done in this project, I think that you know, one of the, the figures that interests me most is this man, Edwin Lutyens, who was, an, who was a British architect who designed this. And there are a lot of reasons to be interested in, in Lutyens, and I'll just try and give you a couple of them. Um, Lutyens uh, designed something called the Cenotaph, which is in Whitehall in London. And it's just a simple plinth that was put up in London just after the war, and apparently it had a tremendous impact. It really just struck a chord with the people. People crowded around it, and originally there was a, a temporary version. He was then he then made a, a more permanent version of it. Uh, Lutyens had spent much of his career up to this point working on uh, British country homes. He also designed uh, some colonial architecture in New Delhi, India, um, and he was a believer in classical architecture taken to its abstract lengths. He was completely against the idea of putting up uh, typical Christian iconography on these sites. And he became part of the Commonwealth War Commission, or Graves Commission. This was the group that was in charge of, of basically interring all the British soldiers. And there was a kind of internal division within the group and an argument over how the British cemetery should be marked. Um, Lutyens was against crosses um, and instead wanted something, you know, he was, when architectural historians talk about his search for this kind of universal abstract aesthetic, and this uh, monument, T.F. Paul, is seen as his, his masterpiece. Um, 
a couple more things. So in here, there are these complicated intersections of walls. Those of you who are architects might be able to help us out with some of the, uh, you know, the, com the complexities here. All of these walls are just names, okay, from top to bottom. This is called uh, the War Stone, and this was something that Lutyens created as a kind of stand-in, in his mind, I think, for Christian iconography. And Roger Kipling, whose son died in the war, suggested uh, some of the uh, language that could be used on this war stone, and I believe this is, comes from Ecclesiastes. You find this war stone in all of the British cemeteries in France, and I don't have the exact number, but there's something like 150 British cemeteries in the same region of France that I showed you on that first slide. So the British chose to bury their soldiers in a much different way. They buried their soldiers in smaller cemeteries. Um, as opposed to aggregating them all and creating a, a somewhat grander statement. And in these cemeteries, there's, every one of these cemeteries has one of these war stones, or altars as they're sometimes called, and a rugged Christian cross. And eventually, I mean, Lutyens lost out on that, but you know, these are on axis in all these British, in all these British cemeteries. Um, and so that, that's basically how the British uh, soldiers um, are arranged or buried in, in this part of the world. Um, and here's just a kind of shot of what, as you can see, I took this trip to France uh, in February and it was snowing and uh, here's, a, here's a view of what uh, the British uh, markers look like in distinction to the American ones. Okay, so I want to make this connection because I, I think it's important. This is uh, the Vietnam War Memorial in, on the Washington Mall and uh, this is Maya Lin's uh, design. Now Maya Lin was an undergraduate at Yale um, when she entered the competition uh, for the Vietnam War Memorial. And she won the competition, as you all know, and it was somewhat controversial. And the, uh, the, the installation was quite controversial because it was not representational in a kind of traditional way. Uh, it was very understated. Uh, but apparently Lynn was, was uh, influenced by Edwin Lutyen's work. And I think the connection here is important, not only aesthetically, but also philosophically. Lutyen's, it seems to me, in entering that kind of commemorative space was trying to acknowledge the trauma, the thing that could not really be named. And in fact, Lutyens in 1917, he was sent by the British government to the Western Front to scope out the possibilities of creating cemeteries. And he wrote his wife, and he wrote this letter to his wife, and he talked about how you look out over the, over the battlefield, and you see the bodies just kind of tucked into the earth, and the poppies growing up all around them, and how pathetic and moving it all was. And he said the only way you could properly you know, commemorate these men is just put up a great big brass ball in the middle of the field. So that was his sort of declaration of his, this kind of abstract, his said, you cannot mark that which is unnameable. And so if I, if, again, back to the argument that I would make in this, in this presentation, the British, or at least legends in particular, preferred not to name the patriotic ideals or the nationalistic values that uh, animated the war, whereas the Americans did. And I think that had something to do with uh, Lutyen's awareness of the trauma that the war had caused in the sense that it was a well, it, was, it, it didn't make sense. And so how best to acknowledge that war except by, uh, by listing people's names, which have a very concrete presence. And that's what Lynn, I think, is able to evoke in this particular uh, installation. All right, onward. So uh, I wanted to show you this. This is Shiloh. Um, and this will give you a sense of the difference between what the Americans did in World War I and how uh, at least the United States, the, 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 the Union, chose to commemorate uh, and mark the graves of Civil War soldiers. And this is unlike, this is somewhat different from the other national cemeteries, but what's interesting is that this in here, these are all, I think, soldiers from Ohio. Okay, so you get the sense of a lot of these uh, national cemeteries, particularly the ones that are connected to the, uh, to the military battlefields, that there's still a very strong sense of state identity. Okay, so if you go to Gettysburg, you see monuments for different states and so on and so forth. That all gets kind of re gets transformed in World War I as there's this effort, I think, to realize nationalism on a different kind of scale. Everyone dies for the United States, not for the United States and for Ohio, if you will. Okay, I just wanted to show you these. These are images of the National Cemetery System. I just wanted to show you that uh, if you look in through here, this is a World War I veteran. Of course, people came back to the United States. They didn't die in the war, and then they were eventually... Um, they were eligible to be buried in the National Cemetery System, as all honorably discharged members of the military are now, along with their spouses. Um, and of course, you know, there were also bodies brought back and you know, buried, presumably in some of these national cemeteries, but also in private cemeteries. Families have the ability to choose that. This is in Leavenworth. This is the Leavenworth National Cemetery. Um, and as you can, you'll see from these other images, this is sort of the thing that's preoccupying now. I'm going around to these national cemeteries and, and making images of them. 
Uh, this is Keokuk, Iowa, uh, on the Mississippi. Uh, I mean, what's so fascinating to me about these sites is the way in which you know the sort of effort to commemorate the soldiers blend in with these everyday landscapes. Uh, this is uh, Fort Rosecrans in San Diego. It's on a kind of spit of land that juts out into the ocean. And again, these are places where American soldiers are buried. And if you go to these sites, you'll see World War I uh, veterans, you know, World War II veterans, Vietnam War veterans, Korean War veterans, all buried in the same space. And one of the things I find particularly moving about all of these places is that everyone is pretty much buried the same way. Okay, there are not, unlike sort of your private cemeteries where you have the ability to create to individualize markers. That's really not how it works in military cemeteries. Uh, this is Marietta National Cemetery outside of Atlanta. Uh, this is uh, Jefferson Barracks, uh, which is one of the larger cemeteries. This is in St. Louis. Okay, so I'm going back to Europe now, and I want to make a quick point, or uh, and I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm nearing the end of my slideshow. But one of the things you find when you visit these sites, and if you go as a tourist, you're going to probably want to see a lot of different sites, right? Um, but the Americans, the, Ameri the ABMC, when they put together these sites, or when they cited them, they had in mind very sort of mindful tourists who were might have been veterans, might have been people who knew something about the war, and they wanted to come back and look at these sites with the war in mind. So the point I'm trying to make by this picture, and I'll show some other ones that do the same, is that all these sites are interconnected. Okay, so these arrows down here, this is pointing to the cemetery, the Museo Dunn Cemetery. These are interconnected commemoration sites, and the ABMC created them with that in mind because they created sites that were connected by virtue of the historical landscape they were on, the battles that were fought on those lands, and then their their signage that, dir that directs you. Okay, now you're at this is at Montfaucon. This is how you get to the cemetery. You know, it gives you a sense, a relative sense of where you are in the terrain. Okay, and this is at Meuse Argonne. Again, this is just kind of like a little orientation table that tells you a little bit about you know where the battles were. You don't see this in the other in the British cemeteries or in the French cemeteries that I visited. So uh, I think this is at Chateau Thierry, which is a, a kind of marking these Ain Marne uh, salient. So what the American Battle Monuments Commission did through its research, there was a historical division of the American Battle Monuments Commission, and they were in charge of researching uh, the movements of the American Expeditionary Forces. And what they did is that they documented that history visually through maps that they placed on nearly all the monuments and cemeteries. It was it to say, okay, if you're coming to visit these places, you want to understand what actually happened to them, what it is we're kind of marking. This is their way of marking the battlefield. And as you'll see as we go forward, this was informed by a tremendous amount of research that was done by the ADMC staff. They reached out to uh, division commanders and basically asked them to remember what happened on the night of you know, September 5th, 1918, and then they compared notes in order to establish a, you know, a, a true record of the, of the conflict. And again, and then they brought all of that into these sites. Now, okay, so this is, uh, my wife said, why are you showing that image? Okay, it's not as pretty as the other ones, but I want to say that this, is, this comes from the National Archives, and the American, when the, the American Battle Monuments Commission was, was, when it originated, it was, for, it was created as a board within the War Department. And there was a lot of discussion about, okay, you know, what are we going to do after the war is over? How are we going to mark the AEF's role in the war? And there was this idea that uh, the Americans should create relief maps. And that's what we were going to do. Uh, and we, that's what the United States was going to do. Somewhat similar to the Gettysburg. So if you go to Gettysburg, it's a driving park. They imagined that northeastern France was going to be like a memorial highway. And you'd stop, you'd drive along the road, and you'd stop, and you'd look at these relief maps that would show you how, you know, where the battle was fought. Now, this turned out not to be a very uh, practical plan, uh, but there's proof that, in fact, people thought about it. And uh, the American government had something slightly more grandiose in mind when they created these memorial sites. Uh, here's, again, the Museo Argonne. Here's another one of these maps that you find in, uh, on these installations. These are carved into the wall. They're etched onto the floor. Uh, there you find them in the chapels. All right, so I had to show you this. This is an image of. Uh, from the American Battle Monuments Commission archive. Um, so their archive is down in College Park, Maryland, which is a, a satellite of the Washington National Archive Office. There are 40 linear feet of documents relating to the ABMC. Um, and uh, they had to do with the, the ones I was looking at, had to do with the development of the commission over the 1920s and 30s. 
basically the research that was gone that went into the creation of these sites and the research that went into creating a, a history of this of these battles was uh, conducted during the 1920s and 30s at the same time that they were also uh, developing the architectural plans to create these sites. Now I should tell you that all these sites were were were, were uh, commemorated in one fell swoop on uh, 19 in 1937, but there was a lot of work that led up to this, including the publishing of a tour guide in 1927, which people could read and take them on their uh, travels through Europe to go from one site to the next. This was a history of World War One as seen from the American point of view. There's nothing in there about the Allied movements and. So there's a written history that the ABMC was working on. And in fact, Dwight D. Eisenhower, one of his first assignments after the war, was working within the American Battle Monuments Commission, and he helped write that book. And he didn't much like the assignment because there wasn't enough action, but apparently he and his wife were pretty happy living in Paris. So this image, um, this, this, is a, this was part of an argument that was going on within the ABMC about where they should cite a monument. And so basically, the officer who drew this up was going back and forth with X.H. Price, and trying to make the argument that some people had been lobbying for to create another memorial that would go alongside the Malfasano Memorial. And eventually this was scuttled. But the point I want to make here is that the people who were working with the ABMC, that is to say the, uh, I'm going to finish up in a second, the, uh, the people who worked closely with the ABMC, the officers, were using, in, in creating these photographs and drawing up maps to document uh, or to commemorate and mark the battlefields, were using the same techniques that they used during the war to fight the Cartography was a huge deal during World War I. Millions of maps were created to help fight the war. And you know, photography was also an important part of uh, helping people orient themselves around the battlefield. So what's interesting to me is that the same soldiers who fought in the war then used the tools of war to commemorate the war. Okay, so here's another example of these sort of, uh, you know, cross-section uh, uh, photographs, which, by the way, photographs just like this uh, make up these terrain photographs that I was telling you about before. You can go online and find these terrain photographs. Um, there's something like 19 volumes of, uh, volumes of them. And the written history uh, that the ABMC was trying to create during the 1920s and 30s ultimately became divisional histories that were, weren't published until World War II. So basically they created all this, this information, uh, they updated the tour, the, the tour guide, and then in the 1940s they wrote divisional histories. Uh, of the battles that were fought during World War I. And I make that point because there was, this is a, this is a kind of, uh, this is the academic myth that I'm about to dwell upon. But a lot of people who've written about the American Battle Monuments Commission have said basically they were involved in public relations work, that they were wanted to sway the memories of the populace, that in a way the work they were doing was propaganda. But in fact, if you go in and you look at this work, you find out they were in fact doing very credible historical research in trying to figure out what actually happened in the war. All right, I'm finishing up now. This is Bella Court. Uh, again, this is a really sort of graphic illustration of the way in which the ABMC folded maps and orientation tables into their monuments. This is outside uh, the American uh, Cemetery at Sun. And this is looking out at the, uh, at the farm fields. Uh, this is the Butte de Montsec. Um, this was the only place where the ABMC was able to really put their, do their relief map big time. And so you go into the Butte de Montsec, which looks a little bit like the Jefferson Memorial. It's up on a hill, and in the middle of the, in the, middle of the uh, structure, there is this relief map. And you go down there, and you can see this kind of detail. And what they're trying to do is actually, you know, it's a kind of locational device. It's as if you're standing right where the battle was being fought. Uh, and uh, interestingly, I mean, there's been a lot of conversation about, or there's been a fair bit of scholarship written about the Beaux-Arts architecture. Uh, that surrounds this relief map, but not a lot of attention given to the fact that this kind of engineered design had a significant bearing on what the architecture actually looks like. And so it's interesting to me that the military in this respect had an, had an important, actually, an impact on how these places were, how these sites were designed. And that's my final image. Uh, this is an uh, Malfasson. Um, this, is, this is just a construction marker. It's as if to say the ABMC was here, this is our work, uh, and we want to mark it. Thank you. Yes, sir. I have three questions. One, do we, the taxpayers, help to maintain all those yes. cemeteries? Every single one is overseen and paid for by American taxpayer dollars. Two, the 
head of the commission with presidential changes, does he appoint a new head of the commission? Yeah, I think it's a, a I think it's a presidential appointment now. It sort of revolves depending on the administration. Okay. Um, so there's still a commission, and there's someone who heads up the commission. I can't tell you exactly who it is now. And three, the superintendents on site are they military American personnel? Uh, I believe they are. I believe they have a background in American uh, in the American military. I found that also the case at the national uh, in the national cemetery system. I've talked to people on site there, and a lot of them are veterans. You know, they're sort of reemployed within this part of the uh, military. Military. Thank you. Yes, sir. At these grave sites in France, which came first, the graves and the markers or the monuments? The graves came first, and then the monuments and the cemeteries uh, sort of coalesced together in the 1920s and 30s. Okay. Yeah, so you can go, there's a whole, there's a history of these uh, cemeteries, or there's an illustrated history of the cemeteries, and you can look at these World War I cemeteries, and you'll see, a, you'll see, you'll see landscapes that look nothing like this. You know, they're wooden markers. You know, they're basically temporary. And so the ADMC came back and you know gave it form, gave it order. Yeah, Bill. I can't remember when I was visiting cemeteries. But are they open 24 hours a day? Or does it mm, depend? I think they're probably open uh, during daylight hours. You know, like seven to dusk. You know, that kind of thing. The American the National Military Cemetery, the National Cemetery System, are supposed to open. They're open every, every day of the year, and they open at daylight, and they close in the evening when it's dark. Yeah, my, my grandmother's two brothers were both um, killed in France in 1917. Is there an online source that you could go and find out where they are? Yeah. Yes. I couldn't tell you exactly what it is, but there's a lot of that stuff online. Um, and not surprisingly, it's... It's a much more significant net undertaking if your, your relatives have been British, yeah. you know, or German for that matter, because there's so many others. But you should be able to do that. I mean, these these places are very well they're very well documented, and you know it's also interesting that there's no segregation here. I mean, there was terrible uh, racial discrimination within the army, uh, you know, during World War One, and you know, African American troops were tasked with burying bodies, but the Cemeteries themselves are neutral with regard to that. I mean, blacks and whites are buried side by side. Interesting. And I think one might have been a flu victim, so he might have just been a mass grave or something. I mean, it was, I'm, I was happy for the coincidence of your talk because this weekend I was in Virginia where my grandmother's grandfather was shot in the Battle of Cedar Creek. You know, and I went and they were able to tell me the park rangers exactly what division he was in, where he was fighting, what time he was shot, where it was, and I could literally go block those grounds. It was really impressive. Well, I think that history is very moving. There's a terrific book, some of you may know, by Drew Gilpin Faust, who's the outgoing uh, president of Harvard, called This Republic of Suffering. And it's basically a history uh, written around the Civil War about how the you know, United States government came to track and bury bodies. And huge care was taken to you know, distinguish one person from another, or to even, there's something in the New York Times a couple months ago about a body, body <coughs> fall found on one of these Virginia battlefields and how important it was to the government to try and sort of sort out to whom it belonged. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I think that there are, a lot, there are a lot of things to be said about military culture, but one of the things that I think can be said without a doubt is that these days the care that's taken to you know, bury people who die in battle is, is really, is really impactful. Tim, I just two things. Um, I was the understanding that the American Cemetery Commission was responsible for the maintenance of the, the cemeteries. Is that correct? Or am I wrong? They, they, well, I think the way it works now is that they outsource the care of these places to, well, to the French, right? But you know, the American taxpayer, the American government pays for their maintenance, if that's what you get. You know, and the second thing is I've had uh, the honor of attending the um, they're visiting the American uh, cemeteries in Colville, um, France, or right? Normandy, and uh, Margraten, and the Netherlands, non Ray Chapelle, I believe, is in Belgium. And it seems like there's a real stark difference between the, the 
the construction of the cemeteries between World War I and World War II, because those three seem to be, you know, more adapt to building into the landscapes as opposed to having the more monolithic structure. You're talking about World War II ones, monolithic? Yeah, the World War II ones, right. And I just wondered if you had a chance to visit those or... Come I've been in Normandy. I haven't gone to any of the other World War II sites. I've talked with people who have. I mean, if, if there's another phase of this project, that's something I'd like to do. Um, you know, I don't mean to sound glib, but I think the American Battle Monuments Commission found a kind of template. Uh, they developed a template in World War I, and then they built upon it during World War II. And I, the, from what I've seen, uh, a friend of mine went to Italy and sent me a picture of the map that was created, you know, outside of Florence. And it was, you know, a mosaic. It was a color mosaic that dwarfs anything that I saw at these World War I cemeteries. And so yeah, they, they, they used the same formula, but they just, they went big. Early. Yeah. Yeah, they're very evident at those three cemeteries. Enamel relief. Yes? Uh, when, De, when De Gaulle uh, ordered the American military out of France in 1966, did that affect any of the uh, maintenance or care of the uh, those who were interred or left behind? I don't think so, but uh, what I can say is that there was a fair bit of, there were pockets of, re, of resentment about the presence of, you know, sort of United States landscape in France at that time, and that was something that they had to work through. Um, but no, the, the, these sites have remained, as near as I know, as well maintained, as, as well maintained in the 60s as they were 30 years earlier. Yeah, sir. Perhaps a silly question that I hope someone else might ask. Are there Confederate graves in American National Cemeteries? Oh, that's a great question. Um, and I'm going to try and answer in 10 minutes. No. Yeah, yes, there are. Okay, so in 1862, when this cemetery system was actually created, uh, Confederates were not allotted. They were traitors. They didn't fight for the United States. Therefore, they could not be buried side by side Union soldiers. Um, by the 1890s, when William McKinley became president, he called for the inclusion of Confederate soldiers in these cemeteries. So there are now. You can go to Arlington, and uh, you know there's a section for Confederate soldiers. And in fact, there's a very large Confederate monument in Arlington. Now. I've seen, I've been to a lot of these sites, and Confederates' graves are folded in in different ways. Um, and one of the things that's also really interesting is that there are several cemeteries now that have to include monuments that were put up by the United Daughters of the Confederacy, usually in the 1920s. And following the uh, troubles in Charlottesville, Charlottesville in 1917, um, the United States government hired a private security firm to guard these Confederate monuments to make sure that they weren't, they, weren't, they weren't destroyed. So for instance, one of my first trips to a National, national Military Cemetery was in uh, Elmira, New York, the Woodlawn National Cemetery. And I got there in the early afternoon, a beautiful day, kind of like, it was just like today, in fact. And I took a bunch of pictures, and then this private security guard came up to me and said, you can't take pictures here. And I wanted to say, what do you mean I can't take pictures here? Of course I can, this is federal property, you know, I'm a taxpayer, et cetera, et cetera. I said, well, really, why is that? And he said, the director of the cemetery said that Anyone who wants to take pictures of these sites has to get permission first. This is the this is like one of the only times I've been told this in all the trips that I've made to these cemeteries, and I've been to over 80 of them. And he worked for a group called uh, the Whitestone Group, and basically they made this rule because of what was going on in Charlottesville, because of all the efforts to take down Confederate monuments, and they're afraid of people taking pictures of these monuments and going up on social media and then folks showing up. Uh, to tear them down. So, I mean, we're in this very strange moment now where, uh, you know, the federal government is, some people say, you know, regarding, you know, symbols of, of an effort to not have a more perfect human, so to speak. Um, yeah, Peter. Related to that, uh, but apply to Europe. What, um, how were the German soldiers treated or commemorated? Well, you know, I didn't, haven't spent a lot of time in German cemeteries. Um, there are some. There are some. They're not a lot. I think most of the bodies were repatriated back to, to Germany. Um, there, you know, there's a, I read an interesting article which basically said that, that made the argument that all these cemeteries, the, the design reflects the national value system. So, 
you know, the American cemeteries look like parks, and the uh, English cemeteries look like gardens, and the German cemeteries apparently look like forests, and the French cemeteries don't look much of anything, of anything at all. In this <laughs> Well, when I was there, the German cemetery that I went to were similar to the British. They looked like gardens, but the crosses were all black yeah. and iron. And uh, I remember one in particular, there were a lot of fruit trees. And uh, mm -hmm. but it, it was just as moving as the, yeah. as the I mean, British. It's, it's a really great question, and it's a huge topic. I mean, I don't, I'm not aware of a lot of, there's not a lot of comparative scholarship on, on this aspect of commemoration, and there probably should be. Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you.